her PhD with Marcus Meister at Harvard, and then she continued her work at Stanford in invertebrate vision, and then came to us with all this expertise. And she's really been the key person driving the, these experiments. She'll now talk to you about these large scale surveys, as well as all the infrastructure, as well as the outreach in the, the Python program, the notebooks. She gives many lectures and tutorial, and she's also one of the organizers of our own, just like you guys in MBL, we teach our own summer course. This time also, I'm happy to say in person here on Friday Harbor in on one of the islands north of uh, Seattle. Saskia. Thank you, um, Christoph, for the introduction. Thanks for um, having letting me join you this morning. Um, uh, as Christoph said, I'm going to be telling you a little bit more about some of the observatories that he introduced you to and, and digging a little bit um, into the data as well as showing you some of the tools for um, accessing the, the calcium imaging data specifically. So um, as you heard from Christoph's lecture, we have a number of kind of parallel pipelines that we've been building over the last um, several years to systematically record in vivo physiology in the mouse visual system. Um, and they're, you know, they leverage slightly different modalities. So we've got calcium imaging as well as um, the, the dense electrophysiology. Um, but other than these, and we have some that are have active behavior and some that are, are passive viewing. Um, and other than those, those kind of key differences, which are very big differences, but everything else we try and keep as consistent and as stereotyped as possible so that um, these data sets can be as interoperable as, as we can make them. So I'm going to be telling you about mostly about the visual coding two photon data set, which was our first, um, <clears throat> the first data set that we released uh, that uses calcium imaging to record the activity of hundreds of cells at a time in response to a battery of different visual stimuli. And this was set up to create essentially a, a physiological survey of the mouse's visual cortex. And so we wanted, uh, and we what we did was we sampled data from many different cortical visual areas. So this is an image of the surface of the mouse cortex. Um, this is actually shows you some of the, the areas that are defined through the common coordinate framework. You can see the barrel cortex up here at the top. Here's primary visual cortex, this big area back here. Um, we, we've collected data from primary visual cortex as well as several of the higher visual areas that surround it. So we've got data currently from five of these higher visual areas um, that are, are near it. We've also um, leveraged a lot of the genetic tools that are available in, in the mouse um, in order to record data from specific cells. Um, and so we can use genetic tools to express the uh, calcium uh, indicator. So we use GCAMP, we use a genetically encoded calcium indicator, um, and we can target it to specific cells. And so we can either um, express it, we have some drivers that are what we call pan-excitatory, they're expressed across kind of all of the cells, all of the excitatory cells um, across all of the layers. Um, others are specific to excitatory cells that are found in, in specific layers and sometimes even in subtypes of specific layers. So for here, here for instance, we've got two different drivers um, that both target different populations in layer five. So cortical thalamic projecting neurons as well as cortical cortical projecting neurons in layer five, for instance. And then we also have drivers that allow us to target the inhibitory uh, subtypes of neurons, VIP, somatostatin, and parvalbumin, that allow us to get kind of these specific interneurons um, exclusively. And this, um, so these tools let us um, sample different types of cells based off of transgenic characterization as well as layer specificity um, in order to kind of expand this survey to, to, the, to these different, um, in these different dimensions. And finally, as I mentioned, we use a battery of different visual stimuli that include some kind of classic stimuli, such as drifting gratings or, or um, sparse noise stimuli, as well as naturalistic stimuli, um, flash natural images or natural movies, um, in order to, to really kind of densely survey kind of the visual responses of, of these, these neurons in the populations. And so by having these different um, axes of our, our data set, it allows us uh, to kind of set it up in order to ask questions about um, how vis visual information is represented and transformed through this, this circuit, um, whether we see differences in, in, in visual responses or in physiological profiles across these different cortical areas or layers and, and cell types, and whether the stimulus statistics um, of, of the stimuli that we show can affect the encoding properties of, of the neurons in the populations. 
So again, I mentioned this is two photon calcium imaging um, and you saw a similar video it, during Christoph's talk, but just to kind of refresh you, we're, we can image a few hundred cells at a time. This is one imaging session um, that's been kind of is being played back uh, on a faster speed. And you can see in this panel here that different cells, um, they fluoresce at different times. So when the cells fire spikes, calcium floods into the cell um, and that causes the calcium indicator to fluoresce. And so we see that different cells light up at different times. And this can be related to the stimuli that we're showing, which I'm showing you on the, the far right panel where you see noise or movie stimuli. Um, it can be affected by the running activity of the mouse. I'm just going to play this again. Um, as you can see, this mouse, you know, at different times it chooses to run. It, um, sometimes it, it just stay, it stands still. Um, we know that that can have an effect on some of the activity in the cortex. And then we also have a camera that records the, um, the pupil uh, or the eye of the mouse that's watching the monitor. And so we can record both the pupil area as well as the position. You can see this red dot that we've superimposed on the stimulus um, that corresponds to the position of the pupil um, during the experiment. So these are kind of all of the, the data that we're recording simultaneously. And we have a pipeline that then um, that, that processes and packages this data. Um, and what it does is we, um, we have some algorithms in order to identify, to segment out the different um, ROIs that we believe are different cells in our field of view. Um, we can use that to extract the fluorescence traces for each cell um, that represents the activity of the neuron. Um, we've got all of the information about which stimulus is shown at what time, and we can get those temporally aligned. Um, those are indicated with these kind of shaded colors in the plot here. We've extracted the, the eye position and, and pupil area, as well as the running speed of the mouse. And all of this data, as well as a num number of other pieces of data get um, packaged together into an NWB file. This is a standardized um, data format for physiological data. So you can see here a list of, of most of the components that are in this file for each individual session. Um, that includes kind of these fluorescence traces, the masks for the ROIs, um, the stimulus information, the actual stimulus templates, these are the images and movies that are shown, the running speed, as well as a lot of metadata about the animal and about the experiment um, that can be useful for, for people to, to have available when they analyze the data. So using this pipeline, we're able to collect uh, you know, over 1,400 hours of, of data from over 250 different mice. Um, and so you can imagine that that creates quite a large um, a lot of data, data and requires quite a lot of infrastructure for processing all of that data. And just looking at these fields of view, you can see there's a lot of differences in the density of the neurons, um, which yields differences in, in kind of the signal and noise. Uh, of each field of view. And so um, all of our data processing methods have to be very robust to, to this data. Um, and we've, uh, like I said, we've collected over 1400 hours of, of imaging. Um, this table kind of shows how this breaks down across the different um, transgenic lines that we have. We have 14 different transgenic lines um, that we collected data across six different visual areas. So primary visual cortex here, and then these five higher visual areas. So in total, we've collected data from uh, over 63,000 neurons in 456 different experiment containers. Now, each container um, uh, is, is consists of three different imaging sessions. So we return to the same field of view, the same set of cells on three different days um, in order to sample our full visual um, stimulus set. Um, and so that's, that's uh, so we have, you know, many more hours uh, for 456 containers. And just again, to kind of unpack this for you, I went over this a moment ago, but just to kind of reiterate, these different transgenic lines, they map onto both excitatory and inhibitory cells. Some of them are broad kind of pan-excitatory lines. Others are layer specific, or then our inhibitory ones are specific to these interneurons. The vast majority of our data was collecting using GCAMP6 fast. Um, there's a little bit of data that was collected using GCAMP6 slow, um, primarily the data for the parvalbumin Cree line, but a little bit of data with one of our pan excitatory lines, this SLC line. Um, and you can see that not every Cree line was sampled across all of the different uh, visual areas. And so this table allows you to kind of see how that sampling was done as well. 
Right. So I mentioned that each field of view, we return to the field of view on three different days in order to sample our full stimulus set. So the first session will include, for instance, drifting gratings and natural movies. And then the second session will be static gratings and, and natural scenes. Uh, the last session has this locally sparse noise. Um, each session has at least five minutes of spontaneous activity, as well as five minutes of one of the movie clips that we repeat in each session so that we have one piece of stimulus that gets repeated across um, all three days. Each session is packaged in its own separate Neurodata Without Borders file, and so for each um, for each experiment container, there are three different NWB files that, um, that capture all of that data. And so then we have our software kit, the Allen SDK. This is a Python analysis toolkit that allows you to access the data, allows you to find experiments based off of metadata, allows you to extract the, the activity traces as well as other pieces of data that are in the NWB file. Um, and this is, there's a lot more documentation about this. Um, this is a Python toolkit. You can install it using pip install Allen SDK. Um, and I'm actually going to take a few minutes to um, actually give you a, a brief demo of how you can access, um, pull, start pulling out these data uh, so that you can start working with it. Um, and so I want to point to, we've, I've created a, um, a folder, we have a repository called Brain Observatory Examples. Um, up on GitHub, and we have a folder here for uh, for your course BMM 2021, where we've got a number of tutorials or a couple of files in there that I, I'm going to show you. One, this is one of the notebooks in in this folder. There's um, let me actually just jump over to the repository. This is the two photon visual coding tutorial. Um, I've also provided a NeuroPixels visual coding tutorial that my colleague Josh Siegel put together. Um, and so if you're interested in accessing the NeuroPixels data, this is a great place to start to, to see how to access the data and, and how it's organized. Also for both of these data sets, we've created um, a cheat sheet. So I have a, a physical copy, just a two, two side piece of paper. Um, that kind of introduces you to kind of the dimensions of the data set as well as key functions for the SDK. So if, if anybody's using these data and trying to um, figure it out, that's a really useful resource for that. Um, and so those are, are located in this repository as well. All right, so let me jump over to this, this notebook. This is a, um, a Jupyter notebook. Um, and like I mentioned, you, you need to pip install Allen SDK in order to use it. Um, but other than that, it's, it's a pretty simple, uh, getting started is pretty easy with these notebooks and I, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with it. Uh, we don't have very many dependencies. I we try and keep it a little simple here, but a few dependencies to install or not to install, to, um, to load. Um, and then the key thing here for getting started with the Allen SDK is to instantiate the brain observatory cache. Um, and so again, it's, you are you know, importing the brain observatory cache from the SDK. Um, and then here's kind of, if, if you only pay attention to one thing during this demo, um, it's gonna be this little piece right here. I'm pointing it right here to a manifest file. And this is a file that I have on my local machine. Um, and all of the data um, that I access will get downloaded relative to this manifest file. And so if I wanna, if I download an NWB file, it might take a few minutes for it to download it at, that instance for that first time. But once it's on my machine, if I'm pointing the, the cache to this manifest file, it's going to be able to find the, the NWB file that's previously been downloaded. So this is this path is, you can see it's unique to my computer. Um, it's a local manifest file on my machine. If you're running this for the first time on your local machine, what you wanna do is actually just remove this whole um, component here and just say BOC equals brain observatory cache, and it'll create that manifest on your machine in your working directory. And then in the future, you wanna put that, the path to that file in, that lo in this location, and it'll always um, point to the right place. So that's kind of the only little trick there. Um, but once you kind of have that figured out, um, everything works really nicely because all of your data is organized. Um, if you access any analysis files or the event uh, files, all of those will be organized in, uh, in that same place. All right, so we in, in instantiate the cache. Um, uh, and this gives us access to all of the data for the, the two photon visual coding data set. Um, and so I want to start by showing you how you can use some functions for the VOC to kind of get oriented to the parameters of the data set that I've already kind of uh, unpacked for you a little bit. Um, but we'll use the SDK here. So I'm going to use this function under the VOC that's called get all targeted structures. 
Um, and this gives us a list of all of the visual areas that we have data from. These are all cortical areas for the, for the two photon data set. You see VIS-P is, is primary visual cortex v, uh, V1. And then these are all the other higher visual areas that surround it. So we have some similar functions that give us a lot of the other information that we might use to, to pick an experiment. So get all Cree lines gives us a list of the transgenic Cree lines that we use. These are the drivers that drive the, the calcium indicator um, expression. Um, we also have a list of the reporter lines. Um, these, these are the actual GCAMP um, reporters, right? And for the most part, there's a pretty much one-to-one -one mapping between if you're using a Cree line, it, it, it only was collected with one um, reporter. And so there aren't many situations where this is super important. Uh, there's only one case with this, as I mentioned before, with the SLC17, um, where we did collect some data with um, GCAMP 6 FAST, this AI193, or AI93, and a little bit with the AI94, which is the GCAMP 6 slow. Um, otherwise, it just had to do with which tool worked best for a particular Cree line. Um, and it might be relevant for, for things that you're thinking about. Um, it might not, but just to that is there as well. We can get a list of all of the stimuli that are shown. So this is all the different stimuli that are shown across all of the different um, sessions in a single experiment container. And this is a list of all of the session types. Um, and you'll see here that we um, list four different sessions that start with the prefix three session. Um, and that's because partway through our data collection campaign, we made a modification to our, our session C. Um, this is the session that has locally sparse noise. And so in the early data that we collected, we used three session C that had the stimulus locally sparse noise. Um, then we noticed that the small pixels weren't working very well in the, uh, to drive responses in the higher visual areas. And so we added a larger pixel size. And so we modified that, that one modification. We changed it now to three session C2. This now has locally sparse noise four degrees and locally sparse noise eight degrees. Um, in place of just locally sparse noise, which had four degree pixels. So that's a, um, a subtle detail, um, but just want to point that out. All right, so these gives us some of the parameters and we can use some of these parameters to find um, data that we're interested in looking at. So I'm gonna pick um, one visual area and one Cree line that I'm gonna specify and I'm gonna use this function that says get experiment containers. Um, and this is gonna return um, a list of um, of experiment containers that were collected for this visual area, this P, primary visual cortex, and for this Cree line, Cux2. This is an excitatory Cree line that's in superficial layers. We image it in both layer two, three, and layer four. Um, and so we can see here this list of about 16 experiments. Um, they all have a unique ID. Um, and as I mentioned, for this particular Cree line, we image them at different depths. So some of them were imaged at 175 microns, others were imaged at 275. But they're all in one targeted structure. They're all the same Cree line. They have different donor names, and that's a unique identifier for the particular mouse. Um, but you might see, for instance, there's um, here's one experiment container collected from the, uh, a mouse that we also collected from the same mouse at a, at a deeper, uh, different imaging depth. So we use uh, mice multiple for different multiple fields of view, um, or we might image them in different uh, visual areas uh, to get as much data as, as, from the mice as we can. All right, so let's see. There are 16 experiments that for this particular visual area and this Cree line. Um, this is out of, what was it, a total of 456 experiment containers, right? And so you could see that you could pick different um, targeted structures or Cree lines, or you could, uh, in order to find experiment containers for different, uh, based off of what you're looking for. This is just a visual to remind you that our experiment container consists of three different sessions, session A, session B, and either session C or session C2. Um, and so we can pick one of these experiment containers from the list above. I'm just going to pick the very first one. And let's get a list of all of the individual sessions. And so now you see we have three sessions that were imaged. Um, they're imaged from the same mouse, so the donor ID is the same. Um, and you can see that there are three different session types, session type A, B, and C, and they're imaged at three different days. So this is the age of the mouse uh, when the data was collected. So you could actually see these were collected in reverse order. We collected C first and then B and then A. Um, and then again, each session has its own identifier that's different from the experimental experiment container identifier. And this is what we use to access the, um, to access the NWB file. So I want to get this ID for the session that has the, the natural scene stimulus, um, just uh, so we can look at that. 
Um, and so I'm going to use this function that says get OFIS experiments. So instead of get OFIS experiment containers, I'm looking for OFIS experiments. Um, I'm specifying the experiment container ID that we already have selected above. And now I'm specifying I want the, the session that has the stimulus uh, that's called natural seams. And this gives me a, a unique identifier for this particular session. Now I can take this unique identifier that I'm calling session ID um, and I'm passing it to a function called get OFIS experiment data. And this will allow us to access all of the data in the NWB file. And this, so I'm creating an object that I call here data set. And we can use this data set object to now access all of the data for this particular session. So um, I'm going to show you many of the different pieces, not all of them. There's, there's quite a lot, but this kind of will get you oriented. So for instance, we can look at the max projection. Um, and so I'm using this function called get max projection. I think you've probably noticed um, a theme that all of our functions are get this, get that. Um, and so it, once you kind of start poking around it, it becomes pretty intuitive. Um, but so this is an image, the max projection is an image of our field of view. It's the maximum value for each pixel um, in that field of view across the entire movie. And this basically gives you a really nice snapshot of the cells that were, were in the particular location that we image. So you can see a lot of nice um, looking cells in this, in this field of view. Uh, one of the other things we have is um, ROI masks. So I use the function get ROI mask array. Um, and this returns an array. Uh, that is, you know, 512 by 512 is the, the size of our, our imaging field of view. And we've got a single plane in our array for each of the ROIs. Um, and so you can see that that first dimension tells you how many cells are in this particular field of view. There's 174. And if we just flatten this um, and we can plot kind of all of these masks here, um, and you can, you know, compare this with the, the max projection, um, we could, you know, it'd be more effective if we put them side by side, but you can see that these ROIs line up really nicely with, with those cells that you see in the max projection. All right, so now we wanna start looking at the activity. So we're gonna look at the traces. Um, one of the things that I wanna point out is that there's a lot of different, um, versions of the, the fluorescence traces it, that are available. So if we just do kind of this tab complete, it gives you a list of all of the functions, all of the things that you can get out of this data set object. Um, and we've got, for instance, get fluorescence traces. This will give you the raw fluorescence that we extract from the movie. Um, if, if any of you are familiar with calcium imaging, though, you know that you have to do some um, processing to the, the fluorescence traces before you can, can use them. So there's extracting the fluorescence from the movie. We want to correct for any neuropil. This is, you know, if there's processes from neighboring neurons that are, are passing through that ROI, we want to correct for any activity from neighboring cells that might be getting picked up in, in, with the mask. Um, and so you can also access here the neuropil traces. So we create a, a second mask that surrounds our, our initial, the cell mask, the ROI mask. We extract the fluorescence from that. That's our neuropil trace. And we have a correction um, method that, that um, subtracts this neuropil trace with an R value. And so we have functions here that give you the neuropil traces that give you the R value. Um, and so if you wanna look at those traces and, and those R values for each cell, they're, they're available. Um, once we've done the neuropil correction, we've got what are called corrected fluorescence traces. So these are cells that have the neuropil sub subtraction has already been performed. Um, but another step after that is that sometimes you've got two cells where the ROIs overlap a little bit, um, and we can demix the signals of those cells even where those pixels overlap. We can figure out what activity belongs to this cell and what activity belongs to that cell. Um, and so that's uh, a step we call demixing. And so um, the demixed traces are the traces that have gone through both the neuropil subtraction and this demixing algorithm. Um, but then we, what we usually end up working with is after we've done the demixing, we calculate the, the change in fluorescence, the delta F over F, where we calculate the change in fluorescence normalized by a, a baseline fluorescence activity a, ba with using a sliding window. Um, and this, um, this allows us to see kind of how much that fluorescence is changing across, across the session. And so this is the function that we use. So I've actually put it in here, get delta F over F traces. Um, this returns both timestamps and this delta F over F array that you can see again, we've got 174 um, cells. And then these are the number of time points that we've imaged at. So um, here, I'm just gonna plot uh, the trace for the first cell. Uh, we can kind of zoom in on, you know, uh, this window over here. So you can see 
you know, with a little bit more resolution. Um, but you see there's there's times where the cell is really active and we see these, these nice kind of peaks, um, other times where it's fairly silent uh, and then its baseline is close to zero. All right, so I'm just going to plot, um, that was one cell. Here's the first 50 cells in this experiment. Let's just plot them sort of like a raster plot here. This is the entire one hour imaging session. The, the x-axis here is the imaging frames for the two photon movie. Um, and you see these different cells from this particular session um, and different cells are active at, at different times. Uh, and we see kind of bursts of activity uh, for different cells in, in different places. All right, so, um, different cells are active at different times. What can this possibly be about? Well, uh, let's start to look at the stimulus. Um, so we can pull up some information from our, uh, our, our experiment about what stimulus is being shown when. I'm gonna start very coarsely by just getting what we call the, the stimulus epoch table. And this just tells us um, which stimulus type is shown and when it starts and when it ends. And so we're not talking about individual trials. We're just saying we've got 10 minutes of static gratings followed by 10 minutes of natural scenes five minutes of spontaneous activity, and then we show natural scenes again. And so what we actually have done is we've interleaved the different stimuli kind of in amongst each other so that we don't just show all of one stimulus at the beginning and all of the other at the end. And then if there's differences in the responses, maybe it's because the cell is, is dying or you know things like that might be happening. So I can take this stimulus information, I'm gonna overlay um, I'm gonna, just going to shade in the plot above of those uh, the delta f of ref traces for those first 50 cells. Um, I'm going to color in the epochs of the different stimuli. Um, so you can see that you know we've got blue, I think, is our static gratings, and then this orange color is the natural scenes that we see three different epochs. And now when we look at the activity of these 50 cells, uh, we start to see that you know some of these cells are really active. So this cell here, um, it's you know really active when we show the natural scenes, but it's less active for this, the static ratings, the spontaneous activity. But the natural scenes come back, um, and the the cell is is active again, but then shuts down again when it goes back to gratings. So we're starting to see that there might be some stimulus specificity for some of of the neurons that that we're uh, recording from here. Another piece of data that we have here in our NWB file is the running speed. Um, so I use this function get running speed. I'm going to plot the running speed of this mouse. So it has kind of this really long um, continued burst of, of running kind of late in the experiment with a few little bursts of, of, of running earlier. I'm gonna add this to our plot, excuse me. Uh, so we've got the activity of these cells, the timing of the stimulus epochs, and now the, the, the mouse's running speed um, all together in one figure. And we can pull up some, some individual cells from this. I'll just show you kind of three of my favorite cells um, from, from these examples. So this one, this is actually the, the top row here. Uh, this is, I think, a really um, fun cell where um, you, we see it's, it's not super active except for during this spontaneous activity as well as these two bursts here. There's little 20 or 30 second um, gaps between our stimuli between, for instance, the natural scenes and the natural movies here, um, where we show mean luminance gray, which is the same thing that we show during the, the spontaneous activity. So the, the, the luminance is the same as the whole hour, but there's no patterns, there's no stimulus on the monitor. Um, but so whenever we go from, when we switch from what is this, the natural scenes to the spontaneous activity, we see this big increase of activity. The cells really active during this whole spontaneous epoch. But then it gets quiet again when we return to the stimulus. But after the, in these little gaps between the stimuli, we see these bursts of activity. And so this is a cell that seems to actually be suppressed by pattern stimuli, but show kind of big bursts of activity uh, when we release those patterns. Uh, so it's a type of response that we call a suppressed by contrast response. Um, that, that can, that's a pretty interesting phenomenon that we see. Uh, here's another cell taken from the plot above um, where we see that the activity of the cell kind of seems to follow the running activity of the mouse, right? It's not a perfect one-to-one -one match, but we see that when the mouse is, is running, there's more activity from the cell. And when the mouse is stationary, the cell is pretty quiet. Um, another cell from that same experiment, that's almost the opposite, right? It's not that it's um, 
perfectly, you know, it doesn't respond at all when, when the mouse is running, but it's less active when the mouse is running than it is when the mouse is stationary. And you can see, you know, it's pretty well driven by these natural scenes, but those response amplitudes are much smaller during uh, when the mouse is running than when it's stationary. And you can see kind of this interdigitating of, of running and activity during these other stimuli uh, that suggests that this is a cell that is kind of anti-correlated with, with running. Um, so just very coarsely pulling up stimulus timing, activity traces, running speed, we can already start to see some pretty interesting phenomena in the data. All right, a couple, just a few more things that I want to show you before I go back to telling you some things that we've learned with the data. But um, we do, I've, I've been showing you the delta F over F traces. We do also have um, event times that we've extracted um, from these fluorescence traces using a method that was developed by Daniela Witten and her student Sean Jewell there at the University of Washington uh, here in Seattle. Um, and these are the events that we've actually used for our analysis um, and uh, in the, the work that I'm going to show you. These are available through the SDK. They're not in the NWB file currently. Um, and so the way that you access them isn't using the data set object, but is actually going back to that the brain observatory cache where we has a, have a function called get OFIS experiment events. And again, you pass it the session ID for the individual session and it returns um, an array. It's the same shape as the delta F over F. Um, so the number of cells, the number of time points, but these are the extracted event times and event magnitudes. Um, and so here I'll just show you for one cell, here's the delta F over F trace. There are the events that we've extracted for, uh, for that trace. Um, and so some analyses are easier to do with these events than others. Um, and so you can, um, those are available. You, here I can make the same plot I made before this 50 cells with the stimulus. Uh, and the running speed. And so we see the same thing with the events as we do with delta F over F, uh, but they're, they're, they're somewhat a little bit easier to use uh, for some types of analysis. All right, and then I've shown you the, the stimulus epoch table. This basically says this is the 10 minutes that we're showing stimulus type A, um, but we also have more specific trial information. So we have this, the function that get stimulus table, and then you give it the name of the specific stimulus. Um, and so we can get a table that gives us for each trial of the natural scenes here, it tells you what image was shown and then when it started and when it ended. And these again are the indices that map into these um, fluorescence traces. Um, and we have a similar one for the static grading stimulus, but here um, we tell you kind of the, the, we tell you the parameters of the stimulus because those are cre created programmatically, these grading stimuli. So the orientation, the spatial frequency, the phase of the grading, but then again, when it starts and when it ends. Um, the, the frame number here, the image number for the natural scene um, stimulus, and this is also true for the natural movie, this maps into our stimulus template. And so I mentioned this is something that's included in our NWB file. And so this function get stimulus template returns an array of all of the images uh, for the natural scenes. We have the same thing for the natural movies, as well as for the locally sparse noise stimulus. Um, and so this is an array. It has 118 images, and that's the number of images that we show. And so, for instance, we can pick a random uh, scene number. Here's scene number 101. Um, and this is the actual image that, that we showed to the mouse, this kind of burrowing hole in, in the ground. Um, the first trial on this table is frame number 81. So we can look at that. Scene number 81 is this fence with a shadow on it. Um, so we have a lot of different images. Um, this lets you kind of dig into them and, and see kind of what they are, and you can build that into your analysis. Um, and then we can use, for instance, the stimulus table to say, we want to look at all of the times that we showed this image, scene number 101. I'm going to look at the response of cell, cell number one for all of the different times that I showed image 101. And now I'm plotting all these different trials. You see this has a really robust response, although the, the amplitude of this response is quite variable across all the different trials for this particular cell. Um, so just that, you know, now you can start putting these pieces of information together in order to start looking at the different activity um, and, and responses of these different cells. I'm going to um, jump back to my talk. I'll just tell you there's, uh, well, we have this function get metadata. This is where you get all of the metadata about the animal, the sex of the animal, the age of the animal, um, as well as which actual device we collected the data on. Um, so we have a, a number of different microscopes. Um, some of this might not be super relevant for you. Other pieces of metadata here might be super important. So um, that's just something to point out. 
Um, there's, I have some more stuff in this notebook. Uh, there's a little exercise here on looking at signal correlations as a function of the distance between neurons. So if you're interested, this is a great way to kind of get more familiar um, with the pieces of data that we've, we've pulled out. But I'll leave that to you to do. It's all in this notebook. Um, so it should, it should be pretty self-explanatory. So um, that should give you a, a bit of a uh, insight into how to access the data and use it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've done uh, with, with these data, um, some of the analyses we've done and what we've learned from it, uh, just to kind of give you a little flavor of, of, of some of the stuff that we've, we've been able to pull out it. But as, as Christoph has mentioned, there's been a number of, of paper, a couple dozen papers from external groups. There's just a lot more that can be extracted from these data sets. So this is um, work that's in our platform paper. Um, this work, uh, I co-led with uh, my colleagues Jerome and, and Michael in collecting and an analyzing this data. So I do want to kind of give, give them um, a shout out at this point um, as we dig into to some of the data. And so to start, I want to show you one of the cells in our data set. So there's 60,000 neurons. Here's one of those 63,000 neurons. This is a pyramidal cell in layer five of V1 showing responses to the different stimuli that we show. So for instance, we show um, a drifting grading stimulus that has sinusoidal gratings that move in eight different directions and at different temporal frequencies. These are the speed of, of the grading. And we have this plot down here, we call this um, a, a star plot that summarizes the cell's response. So each arm of this plot corresponds to a different direction of motion and each ring corresponds to a different speed with the slow speeds in the center, the fast speed and the outside. And at the intersection of the rings and the arms, you see dots, a number of dots. And each dot is a single trial and the color of the dot corresponds to the strength of the response on that trial of this neuron. So if it's a dark red dot, that means the cell had a strong response. If it's a white dot, it means that the cell didn't respond. Um, and so it, for most of these conditions over here, for instance, you don't see any dots because they're all white. Um, and so there's, you know, there's still plenty of trials being shown of all those conditions. There's just no responses. But we see there's really reliable responses um, up here, which corresponds to these horizontal gratings that are moving up, that are moving vertically. Weaker responses for the downward motion, but some sort of response for the downward motion, but much stronger responses for these upward uh, directed gratings. We also showed static gratings. These are, again, sinusoidal gratings at six different orientations, uh, but there's no motion. These are just flash gratings. There's six different orientations and five different spatial frequencies, and these correspond to the period of the grating, the, the width of, of the gratings. Um, and so again, this plot shows uh, each arm is the orientation, each, each ring or arc here is the, the spatial frequency, the, the low spatial frequency in the center, the high spatial frequency on the outside. We see that the responses here um, cluster at, again, this horizontal uh, grading, maybe slightly off axis. Uh, we see these responses over here um, and these kind of intermediate uh, spatial frequency values. We use the locally sparse noise. These are white and black spots that are, are flashed in different locations on the monitor. And we can look at the responses of the neuron to the position of these spots. And we do this separately for the white spots and the black spots to look at the on subunits and the off subfields. Um, this particular cell, we didn't see any off subfields, but we had this nice um, receptive, spatial receptive field for the, the on stimulus, the white stimulus, uh, kind of on the side of the, the monitor um, as we showed it to the mouse, so kind of over to the, to the left. We show 118 different natural images. Um, these, this, what we call a corona plot, each ray of this plot is a different image. Um, so there's 118 different rays. Um, again, each dot is a single trial. There's 50 trials of each stimulus. Um, and so where you see these long, um, you know, rays of, of red dots are the, the stimuli that have consistent responses across many trials. So there's, you know, about four images that this cell has a pretty reliable response to. And the other images, you know, it might respond once or twice, but it really doesn't have a very robust, um, reliable response to them. And then finally, we showed a couple of different natural movie clips um, and the responses to this movie. This is essentially a raster plot that we've looped around in a circle like a clock. So each um, row here is a single trial. These red, um, these red tick marks correspond to the events. And you can see across the different trials, um, there's a couple of times where we see pretty reliable responses across the 10 different repeats of the movie. The outer ring in blue is the average across the 10 trials. Um, and that really kind of hits home this, this really robust responses at these, these couple of time points down here. 
So if we take all of these different responses and we start to piece them together, right? We, we think about it, the cell has this spatial receptive field. It responds to light things kind of on the side of, of the, the image. Um, we, we saw that it responded to horizontal, maybe slightly angled um, edges, particularly when they're moving upwards. Uh, these were the four images that the cell responded to that we saw from the corona plot. I went and pulled out these images. And, and so we can start to think about this, this light, uh, maybe a slightly angled edge, and we can start to think that maybe it's this uh, the this the lightness with this the contrast of that edge right there that could be driving it or maybe the the edge of of the tiger's back that could be driving this one cell. Um, this is the movie clip uh, at the time when it responded, and you'll notice there's this street organ that this bright street organ that comes into view right on this on this side right where that that light spatial receptive field is and so we can start to piece these together and think about all right this cell likes it when there's this this light maybe with a contrasting edge um, maybe at a slight angle on the the left side of of of, of the image um, and you know put put all of these together in in this way and we can start to try and create like what is it that what's the what are the features that drive this cell the best um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do with this data set was to kind of test this idea of what's called the standard model, right? So for many decades, um, the people in the field, we've been recording from individual neurons and we can record their spatial and temporal receptive fields. And we've come up with um, this standard model that consists of a, a, a linear filter um, uh, that has both spatial and temporal features. This, it, this diagram just shows the spatial, but this both a spatial temporal linear filter, the output of which gets passed through a, a static nonlinearity. Um, and that we can predict the responses of a cells based off of this, um, this, this, this feature, right? This, this spatial temporal feature and, and how well a visual stimulus matches this, this feature will predict how well the cell responds to that particular, um, this particular stimulus. So this, these examples, this is from a, a nice review paper uh, from Karen Dini et al. from you know, a decade ago. Um, these are examples of, of retinal ganglion cell or LGN. We've got these concentric circles where there's like a light spot surrounded by dark. Um, and so when you have features in the stimulus that align with that particular location with that particular light and dark combination, we get a nice strong response. But if you have the opposite, so say if you have a dark spot on a light background, you'd see no activity at all, but the light spot, you get a nice um, large response. Moving into the visual cortex, we've got our simple cells. These now have um, elongated orient oriented receptive fields um, that then pass through this half wave um, uh, nonlinearity. Um, the rectification, right? And so if you've got kind of a dark edge with light flanking it on the sides at a particular orientation, you get this strong response, but the opposite, a light edge um, in that particular location would not drive the sound. So it's pretty phase sensitive, whereas complex cells show that same elongated um, oriented um, structure, but they're now phase insensitive because they've now got um, kind of this, this squaring um, uh, uh, nonlinearity, right? And so we've got the phase invariance of the, of the complex cell. All right, so um, we want to, just to kind of reiterate this, I'm sure this is pretty familiar to all of you, but so if this is a simple cell receptive field, if we've got a grading stimulus that lines up with the orientation where the dark falls in the dark and the light is on the other, those two other sides, we're going to see a nice response from this simple cell. Um, and we expect that if we were to show it, for, for instance, this natural image where the stem of this flower falls in that same location, we'd expect to see kind of that same type of uh, a, a nice response from this cell as well. And so, you know, this is kind of what I was just talking about when I was, you know, trying to draw together all of the features of these different stimuli that are driving this particular example cell really well and think about, all right, we can start to think about um, a spatial feature in this area that is, is, is driving the cell. Now, this is one cell and we can't go through each cell like this laboriously. And so we wanted to test the standard model um, in our data set. And so we implemented uh, the standard model using a 3D wavelet projection, dense wavelet basis um, that capture both spatial and temporal features um, at the, the level of the mouse visual acuity. So we're using spatial and temporal features that are appropriate. Um, we follow this with both linear and quadratic um, nonlinearities um, so that we can capture both simple and complex types of responses. And then we can fit the weights for all of these different um, spatial temporal features with either of these um, with either of these rectifications in order to kind of find the combinations that best predict each individual cell. 
And we can train and test this either using the natural stimuli, these are the images or the movies, or using the artificial stimuli, these are the gratings and the noise. Um, and we can build the models that best predict the responses of each cell. Uh, we also include the mouse's running speed because we know that this um, is an important uh, a factor for, for, for many cells in the visual cortex, that the running can modulate these responses. And so for the example cell that I showed you before, we can look at how well we can predict this. We do a nested six-fold cross-validation. Um, so we're, we're doing this with, with cross-validation here. Um, and so we can look at how well it, it, it predicts the responses. And we see it this, this does pretty decently, right? Uh, we can build the, the features. We can find the features that we get our values here for both artificial and natural stimuli, where our values are about 0 0.5, 0 0.6, which is pretty, pretty good. Um, we consider this to be a, a, a well-performing uh, model. Um, but if we look across our entire data set, um, it's, it's not the norm. Um, so most of our data actually is very poorly predicted using this, this standard model. Uh, so this is a density plot. So the color corresponds to where the bulk of the data, um, the bulk of the cells are, um, which is down here very close to zero, zero. Um, so a lot of our cells, uh, the majority of our cells are really just not being well predicted by this model. So we can start to think a little bit about why, um, why this might be, why the standard model isn't doing a great job. Now, I, you know, just to, to step back for a second, we've known that the standard model isn't perfect, right? This isn't a, um, a new thing. There's a, actually a, a lovely book chapter called What is the 85% of V1 doing that kind of points out a number of the deficiencies of the standard model. Um, so it's not that uh, we're, we're completely shocked by this, but we're maybe a little bit shocked by this. I think we were expecting more of our cells to be up here like the example um, and not so far close to, to zero, zero as, as we found in this data set. But to think about what might be going on, I'm going to pull back to this visualization. This is basically the same plot that I made in, in the demo a few minutes ago, where this is just the activity of 50 cells from one experiment um, with the stimulus types, uh, the stimulus epochs shaded above it. Um, and I pointed this out uh, during the demo as well, that there's some cells that are active during some stimuli and then not active during the others, right? Uh, we see, you know, this is an example here of this cell that is really active during the static gratings and it switches to natural scenes and the cell gets a lot quieter um, and stays really quiet until we come back and share the static gratings again. So it's not like the cell died. It's not like we lost the cell, um, but uh, it only really, it has these really robust responses for the static gratings that we don't see for other stimuli. You can see similarly, here's um, a cell that shows a nice response for the natural movies. These movies are shown 10 times in a row. And so you see this nice little periodic response here. Um, but when it switches to the natural scenes, which have the same um, spatial uh, uh, spatial parameters, right? The same, um, uh, you know, the same spatial structure, uh, the cell stops responding very robustly uh, for, in this particular example. So we see that different cells really seem to respond to some stimuli and not others. Um, and they do so with different reliabilities, kind of how consistently a cell responds. So if I, if there's one image that a cell responds to, say that image of the tiger waiting in the water, um, and if, uh, if, if that's the, the cell that drives, uh, if that's the image that, cells, that drives an individual cell the best, if I show it 50 times, how many times does the cell respond to that particular image? And we can think about that percentage of, of trials that it has a significant response for its preferred image as the reliability of that response. And so we compute that reliability for these different stimuli. Um, and you can see here, I'm doing a pairwise comparison, um, looking at the correlation of the reliability of the responses of a cell to all of the different stimuli that we show. So we've got here static ratings, drifting gratings, natural scenes, and then these are all natural movies. And you'll see there's natural movie 1A, 1B, and 1C. And this is the movie that gets repeated in each of the three different sessions, in session A, session B, and session C. And so um, this is really important because this is the same stimulus being shown to the same cells, um, but on three different days. And this gives us a little bit of a, a benchmark as to the kind of variability that we might expect from day to day of the same neurons response to the same stimulus. Um, and so uh, there we see, you know, when we're looking across natural movie 1A to natural movie 1B and 1C, we see R values that are about 0.4, maybe 0.5. So this is kind of a you know, the, 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 some of the higher values that we're seeing, but mostly what we see, for instance, if you look at drifting gratings, if you look at its, the correlation of the reliability of a cell's response to its preferred drifting grading condition um, compared to the reliability of its response to the natural scenes, that correlation is quite low, 
And what this tells us is that knowing whether a neuron responds to drift and gradings reliably doesn't tell us anything about whether it responds reliably to natural scenes or natural movies or static gradings, right? It doesn't mean that it won't respond reliably to those stimuli, right? So it's not anti-correlated, um, but it just tells us that we don't know if it responds reliably to one stimulus type, we really just don't know if it's gonna respond reliably to a, one, any of the other stimulus types that we see. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, sure. So what we're looking at is a correlation of a single neuron. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so this is, I mean, we've averaged together, this is the average across all of the neurons in our data set, but we've computed it per neuron, yeah. And then when you talk about the different sessions, are those over the course of the same day or is that, is that across different days? Those are across different days. Session A, B, and C are on, on three different days, yeah. And uh, what is the drift like in, uh, in this type of experiments? How is it possible that you might be getting signals in the same part of your uh, matrix, I guess, but it might be a different neuron and not the same hmm. across different days. Um, great question. So we, um, yeah, that's a really important point. So we segment the cells in each session and then we match the ROIs from one session to the next. And so um, if, if we image a cell in session A, um, we may or may not even find that cell in session B. Um, so if a cell is really not active in session B, it might not even show up in our segmentation. We might not have an ROI. So not every cell is matched across all three sessions. And this is kind of an important thing when you're working with the data to keep in mind. So I think it's about 30% of our cells are matched across all three sessions. Um, another 30% are matched across two, uh, two of the three sessions. Um, and then there's a 30% of cells that we find only in one of the three sessions. Um, and so this analysis here is only done for cells that we've matched across the, all of the sessions. Thanks. Yeah, okay, great question, thank you. Um, this here is, is oops, sorry, this, this is just doing a, a pairwise comparison across the two different stimuli. Um, we can now dig into this a little bit more deeply by doing a comparison across all four stimuli. And so we did a Gaussian mixture model to look at um, the relationship between the reliabilities of the responses across all four stimuli. So this is drifting gradings, static gradings, natural scenes, natural movies. And so what we've done now is we've collapsed all of the different natural movies that we show, um, and we just take the, the most reliable response of an individual cell, and we use that as its reliability for, for the natural movie class. Um, and so we do this Gaussian mixture modeling, um, and we get these 30 different clusters that you see in this, this heat map here on, on the left. Um, and what this shows you, what we're showing in the heat map is the mean reliability for that cluster for each of the four stimuli. And we've um, set this color scale um, so that uh, things that are red are what we consider to be, uh, have a reliable response and I'll explain in a second. The ones that are blue are ones that are, we think are not reliable responses. And we set that threshold by looking at this first cluster here. So we know that there's some cells and we've known this just by looking at the data and working with the data. We know that there's some cells that just don't have reliable responses to any of the stimuli that we, that we show. Um, and so we, we, the, the, the cluster that has the lowest mean reliability across all four stimuli, we assign to this kind of this none um, cluster. And we then set the threshold based off of the values of, of these reliabilities. We take the, the maximum value here, we add one standard deviation, and that becomes the threshold that we use to set this color scale. So that's the white here. Any reliability above that, we consider to be a responsive and it gets colored red. Below that, it's unresponsive and it's colored blue. So we've got this one cluster that doesn't respond to any of the four stimuli. And then we find clusters that have different patterns, right? So these two clusters have reliable responses to, um, to the natural movies, but none of the other stimuli. Here's one, these, these here, and you can zoom in on this one here, right? It's got reliable responses to the drifting gradings and natural movies, but not the static gradings and natural scenes. And so we can group these different clusters now based off of which stimuli they're reliably, respond reliably to and which ones they don't into different classes. And we can start to see um, the patterns among the classes. Now, one thing that I think is important to point out again, is that even though we have cells that show consistent patterns in terms of um, 
reliable responses to both drifting gratings and natural movies, if you look across the, the, the clusters within this class, there's still a lot of heterogeneity, right? Where some, some of these clusters, they, the respond, cells respond really reliably to the drifting gratings and less reliably to the natural movies. Others are pretty equal. Um, there's still that heterogeneity where how, res, how reliable a cell responds to one stimulus tells us very little about how reliably it responds to another stimulus type. So we repeat this, um, this, this clustering analysis 100 times with different initial conditions in order to evaluate the robustness. We can now look at how many cells fall into each of the possible um, classes, right? So there's 16 possible classes based off of the combinations of these four stimuli. Um, and so I'm showing you here the percent of cells that fall into each of these classes. And so it's important to note there's many classes where we just don't have any cells, right? There's no cells that, for instance, only respond to drifting gratings or static and static gratings together and none of the other stimuli that just that just doesn't happen. Our biggest class, and this was very surprising to us, our biggest class though are these none cells, the ones that don't respond to anything. 35% of the cells in our data set fall into this class. We've got 10% of cells that respond to all of the stimuli that have reliable responses to all four stimuli. You see them uh, down here and in, in these clusters there, but it's only 10% of the cells in our data set. We've a couple of the other big classes. Um, this one here is the drifting gratings and natural movies. These are stimuli that both have motion features to them um, that we think are, are important for driving these cells. Um, and then the natural scene, natural movie, this purple bar, um, these are the ones that have the spatial statistics, the natural scene statistics um, uh, in both the, the natural images and the natural movies where we think that these cells are, are, are particularly attuned to those statistics. So coming back to our standard model, we can start to see how these classes map onto our model performance, right? Um, this was the plot I showed you before, uh, where uh, look at comparing the model per performance for natural stimuli and artificial stimuli. All of the cells, the cells in our none class now, if we just show those cells, that really is that bulk of data down there at zero, zero, right? And this makes sense. If you don't have reliable responses to the stimuli, you're not going to be able to predict those unreliable responses. Um, and so now we start to, you know, now it makes a lot more sense why we have such a bulk of data close to, to zero, zero. The cells in our natural scene, natural movie category, these have actually decent predictions for the natural stimuli, but not for the artificial stimuli, right? And so we see this kind of tail of cells that um, the R values, you know, the median R value here is about 0.3. It's not stellar, but it's not terrible. Um, you can find a lot of cells like that in the literature. Um, and so, yeah, we can get reliable responses to the stimuli that um, we can predict the responses to the stimuli that the cells have reliable responses to. And then the cells that were in our all category that responded to all four stimuli, here now we've got R values of, of 0.4. We see a nice balanced performance between both the artificial and the natural stimuli. And these look a lot more like what we expect based off of the textbook idea of, of, of simple and complex cells with the standard model, where there's features that if it's re regardless of whether it's artificial or natural, if you have something that matches the, those features, it's going to, to drive a response and we can then predict it reasonably well. Um, and so now we see there, there is some something of that, that some kernel of that textbook standard model in our data set, but it's a little bit hidden by some of these different types of responses that are, are a bit more prominent. Coming back to the functional classes, this is a plot I showed you before, just the number of cells or the percent of cells in each of our categories. I've just rotated the plot. We can look at how these are um, distributed across the different areas across uh, that we've collected data from. Uh, and so here, here's V1 and then the five higher visual areas, we see that, for instance, the fraction of cells that don't respond reliably to our stimuli increases as we move away from V1 into the higher visual areas. And in RL, we see that almost all of our cells, it's like 85% of the cells in RL fall into this none category. Um, and so you know, this suggests that as we move away from V1, that the responses either are becoming less visual uh, or they might be becoming more, um, more complex, not in the sense of simple and complex, but more sophisticated, right? They're responding to, to features that aren't represented in our stimulus set, right? So we have a finite stimulus set, and it could just be that we're not hitting the right feature for some of the cells in our data set, particularly in these, these, these higher visual areas that are, you know, further in the hierarchy might be selective for, for more specific, um, specific features. Another thing that I find really interesting, though, is that in these um, higher visual areas, um, 
up until RL. So if we just ignore RL here, the percent of cells that are responsive to the, the motion stimuli, the drifting gradients in natural movies, remains fairly constant. Um, while the ones that are, are responsive to the natural scene, natural movies, um, that actually becomes a smaller and smaller fraction. And if you consider then also that the fraction of responsive cells gets smaller, we're actually seeing of the visually responsive cells in these higher visual areas, um, a, a larger percent of them are now motion selective compared to in, in V1. And so we see that there is this enhancement of motion information, particularly in these two medial areas, AM and PM. Um, and this maps a bit onto our ideas of dorsal and ventral streams and how they map into uh, map onto the mouse visual system. And then finally, we can also look at the, this breakdown across the, the different cell types in our data set. Um, and so this is just looking within V1 across these different transgenic lines and across the different layers. Um, I won't belabor this, but you can, if you kind of focus in here, we have SST, VIP, these are two of the inhibitory interneurons. Um, EMX is one of our panexcitatory. And you can see really big differences here where, for instance, SST, the somatostatin cells, they have very few non cells and they actually about half of them respond to all of the stimuli. They have very robust visual responses. Um, whereas the VIP cells, um, if you only use a drifting grading stimulus, especially a high contrast drifting grading stimulus, you're, you're gonna think that VIP cells don't have visual responses, um, but actually we see they respond really robustly um, to the natural stimuli that we show, both natural scenes and the natural movies. Um, they fall into that, that purple class here, uh, the majority of those, those cells. So we do see some, some differences across some of the Cree lines. The biggest, most interesting differences are between the inhibitory, um, the inhibitory populations. The excitatory populations are, are a bit more similar, and you can kind of tell that just you know, up here in these excitatory lines, they all kind of look roughly the same. So um, to conclude this part, uh, yeah, so there's about 10% of the neurons that look like textbook cells that are reasonably well predicted by, by the standard model for both artificial and natural stimuli. Um, uh, but it's, it's only 10% of the cells and it's a lot more in V1 and fewer in, in the higher visual areas. Um, and so there's a lot of other things that are going on in the mouse visual cortex. Um, and there's a lot of neurons in our data set that don't respond to the stimuli. And so we have a lot of interesting questions now about what they're doing and whether it's about more complex visual features or whether it's integration of different types of sensory modalities. We know that there's a lot of modulation by motor activity or by other sensory stimuli, auditory or, or whisking uh, stimuli in the visual cortex. And so um, there's a lot of questions about what that might be doing within the visual cortex. Um, and then finally, we also know that the standard model, like we know there's deficiencies in this model. And so there's this challenge of, can we develop better models that capture these neural responses, especially as we move across these different areas um, and think about kind of the interactions across the different layers and the different areas. All right, so in the last, I have a few more minutes and I want to very quickly tell you, um, if you're, you know, so for those of you who might be interested in, in, in using these data or honestly using kind of any data of, the, of this flavor, um, I want to point you very quickly to a paper that we just published um, that uh, along uh, that I published along with Josh Siegel and, and Peter Ledehovich. So Josh was one of the leads on our NeuroPixels data set that Christoph was telling you about. Um, and we took our two pipelines and our two data sets um, and did a head-to-head -head comparison of, of the calcium imaging data and the NeuroPixels data, the extracellular electrophysiology. Um, because we want to understand how these two modalities, what they're doing, um, and uh, you know how we can relate the, the data and the, the conclusions that we draw from these two modalities, both with our data but also in the literature as a whole. And here we're really leveraging the fact that we've got these complementary pipelines where you know, these are our, our CAD drawings of the neuropixel rig and of the two photon rig, like the position of the mouse, the position of the monitor, all of these things are exactly the same between these different, um, these different experiments. The only thing that's different is whether we're imaging or, or using electrodes. Um, and those are big differences, right? So these are very different types of recordings. Um, you know, some of these differences are obvious, right? So the electrode is going, you know, through all of the layers, whereas our calcium imaging is in a single plane, um, co collecting a lot of cells kind of across a lateral space, right? Um, we've got spike time resolution with, um, with, with the neuropixel recordings, whereas we've got a, a, a longer uh, kinetic response for, for the calcium indicator. 
Um, so those are some kind of known differences, um, but we want to see kind of what effect does, does the modality have on kind of the types of, of metrics that we look at and the types of conclusions we draw from our data sets. And so um, if, if this is, I, you know, really I want to point you to this paper, but I'll just highlight a couple of the key things that we, we discovered. So in this comparison, we found um, when we look at preference metrics, this is essentially what, what stimulus drives a cell the best, right? What are the tuning properties of a cell? In this case, I'm showing the preferred temporal frequency. What, what speed of grading drives the cell the best? Um, we actually see that these match very nicely between, sorry, um, but these match really nicely between the two modalities. So here in green is the results with um, calcium imaging. In, in gray, are the results with the neural pixels across five visual areas. Uh, we see really similar distributions, and we've calculated a Shannon-Jensen distance, uh, which is very low in this case between these two distributions. And so looking at just kind of like what stimulus drives a cell the best, we're going to get pretty much the same answer with the two modalities. When we look at um, differences in uh, responsiveness, though, we, we actually see pretty big differences. So here we're asking... Um, essentially about the reliability of the response to the cell. We say that a cell is responsive if 25% of the trials of the cell's preferred um, stimulus condition, so the image that drives it best out of all the natural scenes, if it responds or um, has significant responses on 25% of the trials of that particular condition, we consider it responsive. This is one, you know, there's other definitions for responsive, but this is the one that we use and we use it consistently across the two data sets. What we see is that um, we always get more higher responsiveness in the EFIS data than in the calcium imaging. Um, so it's you know, 60, 50, 60% 60 of cells with calcium imaging, and it's about 70, 75% of cells with EFIS. And again, this is that Shannon Jensen distance, uh, which is now actually you know, a substantial dis distance. Um, and this difference in responsiveness, we think, stems from selection bias in the EFIS recordings. So when you're doing these extracellular recordings, the electrodes are most likely to pick up cells that are large cells with large spikes and lots of those spikes. Um, and so if we subselect our calcium data um, to only look at calcium data from cells that have a, a high um, event rate, um, we, and so, so basically what we think is happening is that calcium imaging, we have a lot more cells that have less activity that are just more quiet overall. Um, and so if we select out the quiet cells and only focus on the cells that are, are really active, um, we see that the responsiveness uh, in our two photon data set gets larger, right? And so this is where, if we include 100%, this is our responsiveness across the five visual areas, these different colored traces of the different visual areas, the legends over there. But now if we exclude the, the least active cells and we exclude more and more of the least active cells, that responsiveness goes up and our Jensen-Shannon distance goes down. And so we see a, a, the closest match between the EFIS and the calcium imaging at, when we're, we're only including 20 to 40% of our, our calcium imaging data set. So there's a big chunk of our calcium imaging data set that we think is simply being missed from in our EFIS data set because of this selection bias where we need, we need lots of spikes in order to sort those spikes, right? That's the other thing is there's the recording and there's the spike sorting. Um, and so in order to reliably isolate out the, the spikes of a unit, you have to have enough spikes um, and they have to kind of be big enough to, to really pull them out of the noise. And so that selection bias in EFIS we think is, is eliminating a lot of these quieter cells that are, are in, the, in the cortex. Um, Another component of this is that there, there can be some contamination in the EFIS between neighboring units, uh, where if there's a cell that's firing, like has a big burst of spikes, those spikes might get sorted in with the spikes of a, a, a unit that's being recorded from probes nearby. Um, and so we did a similar selection where we selected um, the EFIS units based off of the ISI violation. And this is one of the QC metrics that is computed for each of the units in the data set. And as we get stricter and stricter with that ISI violation, um, we get um, then we get fewer responsive neurons and we get kind of that best match when we have kind of that strictest criteria that we can put on the ISI violations um, on that EFIS data set. So we think that there's both, we're, we're missing some quiet cells, but there's also a little bit of contamination between the units that contributes to this, this difference in responsiveness. And then another, the other big difference that we see um, between the be, between the two, and this is kind of a huge difference, is in selectivity metrics. And these are metrics um, that basically ask how 
how much does a cell prefer one condition to another? So for instance, direction selectivity, when cells respond to gratings that move in one direction and don't respond to gratings that move in the other direction, we can compute a metric of, of that selectivity of how strongly it prefers the one direction to the other. Um, orientation selectivity is as a similar type of thing and lifetime sparseness is a more generic version of that type of selectivity metric. Um, and so what I'm showing here is the distribution of, of lifetime sparseness um, in this case for the drifting grading stimulus, but we've, we've carried, we've done this analysis for all of the stimuli. Um, and you see that for the calcium imaging in green, um, when we compute the selectivity metrics, they're, they're, the distribution is actually quite high. Their cells are highly selected. They respond to kind of very few stimulus conditions very strongly. Um, whereas for the EFIS data in gray, we actually see that that distribution skews quite low. Um, and here's that, that Jensen-Shannon distance um, is actually quite high here. So these distributions are very different. Um, and this, this difference we think um, is underlies a lot of kind of what's going on with our calcium indicator. And to kind of unpack this, we used a forward model where we took the spikes that we recorded with neuropixels and we passed them through a model to kind of model the fluorescence we'd expect to see for them. So here's the original spike train in blue. And here we've simulated the, the, the delta F over F that we would see for this, the, for this particular spike train. Um, and we were able to simulate this because we've done some calibration experiments and we have a whole other body of work about this calibration where we image cells while we have loose patch recording. So we have spike times and fluorescence from the same cells. Um, and we can then um, parameterize this forward model with amplitude, decay time, and the noise level of, of what the fluorescence traces, um, how they relate to the spikes that are recorded. Uh, we also, in the paper, we've got some figures where we kind of span a, a wide range of these different values to show kind of what that, how they can influence it. But, um, but as a, the key point here, we can simulate the delta F over F. We do the same event extraction that we do for our, our analysis of our calcium data. Um, and so you can kind of see how well that matches that original spike train in this case. But what you can see, so this is the original, the spike times for that cell showing its responses to the gratings that move in different directions. Um, and on the right, we've taken kind of the, the, the mean response across the trial, right? So basically counting up the spikes across each trial. And you can see that there's, um, you know, there's, there's conditions that drive really strong responses, um, but that, you know, different, uh, so these are different directions. There's also different temporal frequencies. That's why you see this little bit of a structure here. Um, uh, when we pass this through the forward model, right? Again, the preferred direction stays the same. This is what I showed you a couple of slides ago, right? We still see the largest responses for this, you know, downward angled um, direction. But the th thing that, that I want to point out is that when you've got trials with a few spikes, not zero, but a few spikes, these are getting quashed through the forward model. Whereas the trials where you've got large, you've got big numbers of spikes, these have kind of a nonlinear boosting um, of the amplitude of these responses. And so we're seeing kind of this, this super linear boost of, of, of strong responses and then a quashing of these, these you know, single spike or just a few spikes that are getting washed out um, through the, 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 what we think is happening with the calcium indicator here. And so if we take all of our, our EFIS data and pass it through this forward model, now our distribution of selectivity actually matches our, our calcium imaging much closer um, than, than the original um, electrophysiology data did in the first place. And one thing that I want to point out is that this is very sensitive to the parameters that you use for your calcium event extraction, what your selectivity um, looks like with, with calcium data. And what this is, what this, the reason for this is that I could come up with a different event extraction that would add in a lot of false positives, right? I could just add in a whole bunch of extra spikes. And it's going to lower my selectivity metric because there's going to be a lot more spikes for the conditions, the non-preferred conditions. Um, but it's not because those are actual real spikes. It's just adding noise to that data. And again, if you look at our paper, we've got a, um, some nice figures that unpack this a little bit and compare a couple of the different methods for event extraction. Um, one of the reasons we like our L0 method that we use is because we have a fairly low false positive rate um, in that. Uh, as you can see kind of in this example, it's a pretty conservative but a pretty accurate um, estimation of, of the events. So those are kind of some key differences between these two modalities that I think are really important to keep in mind because they can have a lot of implications on kind of downstream analyses, such as the clustering analysis that we did uh, of, of the responses across different stimuli. Um, the bottom line is that neither calcium imaging nor extracellular electrophysiology gives you a perfect 
um, ca captures perfectly the activity of, of, of the neurons in the brain. They're both missing things in different ways. Um, and so it's really important when you're analyzing the data and interpreting the results, and then also when you're looking at, um, you know, work in the literature, it's really important to keep those limitations and the, as well as the, the advantages of these different methods in mind um, for really kind of being able to properly interpret what we think is really going on in, in the, the, neural, uh, the neurons underneath them. So with this, I'll wrap up. Um, we, our website will point you to all of our data sets and, and with a lot more documentation. Um, again, our uh, SDK that allows you to access the data, just pip install on SDK. And also we have a forum where you can post questions if you are run into problems using the data or you want to understand more about it. It's a great place to, um, there's already a lot of questions there that you might find somebody has already asked, but a uh, place, great place to post questions and we can, um, and we will all be happy to answer them. And so with that, uh, I want to, sorry, thank everybody on our large team. There's lots and lots of people who contribute to all this work on running these pipelines and analyzing the data. Uh, it's a wonderful team and they all um, have done just great work here. And again, thank our, our founder, Paul Allen, for his vision and, and support for creating such um, exciting open data sets.